Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to talk a bit more today about uh, um, using queuing theory to uh, model elevated traffic analysis. Uh, last year, for those of you who attended, I spoke about the Harren spe space, which is a method of calculation. Um, what I'm going to try to, to introduce today is one way of linking calculation to simulation. I know we've talked about this a lot, um, but there is usually a problem when moving from calculation to simulation, and I'm sure a lot of you do that. You actually go through the calculation process, you calculate, you find you need five <coughs> lifts, 1,600 kilograms, 1 1.6 meters per second, that's fine. Everything was done correctly in the calculation. You move to simulate it and it collapses. And I'm sure a number of people has, have had that happen. Anyone here? Yeah. And, and I've always, I've always, you know, thought, well, I know there's nothing wrong, but why, why is it collapsing suddenly? And I know Adam mentioned yesterday, he said about trying to uh, uh, make it fall over and see what the limit and when does it saturate and so on. So today I'm going to offer you one explanation why that happens and I'm going to offer a possible solution to that. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not looking to, to reconcile the round trip time with the round trip time. That's, that's another problem and I think that's addressed. I'm really talking about waiting time and, and queue length. Now, before I carry on, um, I, had a problem, I had a problem distinguishing these two young gentlemen from Tyson, Tyson Crook. And I thought the best way is if I put them on a photograph, you can see them quite happy yesterday, <laughs> yesterday and smiling. So, left is Ingo. Is that right? No. No? no? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still going to... <laughs> okay, so... Still got a problem. Learning difficulties. Okay, so a quick introduction to queuing systems, applications and elevated traffic analysis. I'm going to talk about steady state and transient response, and that is very, very important to what we're talking about. Especially with the work on ISO, I, I realize there's a lot of work going on in ISO, and how long do you simulate for? And the comb, there's a stepped comb, which I saw, and the stepped comb is important because it's saying simulate it for an hour and stop for an hour, is that right? And then increase. So, uh, so the concept of steady state and transient is important, very, very important, very relevant to what people are putting in ISO now. Concept of a workspace, results. And these are three practical consequences, so that I'm not accused of doing blue skies research or serendipitous research. There are three, some practical applications to this, or consequences. So a queuing system, we all see them. We see them in post offices. You see them in um, <coughs> um, repairs. Repairs can be modeled as queuing. But interestingly enough as well, computer networks. So all computer networks are today modeled as queuing networks. You have arrivals and and, and, and you worked at the computing center at, at some point in time in the National Computing Center. So the queuing modeling allows the designer to take a macroscopic, that's a very critical word. Um, if we want the details, you go into simulation and you look at the door opening and closing. What we're trying here to do is to take a macroscopic view of the whole system. We think of it as a black box. We, we calculate the round trip time and that's all we do. We put the round trip time into the system. And the round trip time represents the speed at which passengers are processed. We're processing passengers through the machine. So any queuing system, this is the terminology, has number of servers C, arrival rate and entities. We call them entities because they're not necessarily passengers. This is the generic term. And the arrival process could be random, but we know reasonably well that it's a Poisson arrival in our case, or exponential for the inter-arrival time. And the service rate could also be random or deterministic. In our case, it's not necessarily Poisson. Uh, but there have been theories about what it is in terms of service rate or processing rate. So MMC is actually a, um, a Poisson arrival, Poisson servicing, C service, which in our case would, would translate into lifts or elevators. That's a general overview. And taking it a bit more detail, that's in fact the first in, first out queue. No priority, extra priority. So that's the lobby. And from the lobby, we only get, in this case, the queue length, the average queue length, and the average waiting time. How long is the passenger waiting in the lobby? And how long is the queue length? If you want to size the lobby, which, which could be useful in some cases. Um, entities arriving and entities emerging. And then we can have, sing the, 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 the queuing terminology could have single, multiple server, single queue, multiple, multiple queues. Um, an entity can balk. You remember Richard was talking about balking when somebody <coughs> approached the lift which he or she perceived as full. 
and they would bolt. And that was a critical point for you because you decided that that's the point where you measure the actual handling capacity. So a passenger can bolt, meaning he or she doesn't join the queue right from the beginning. Renee, he will join the queue but leave it later on. And then there's the jockey, I think jockey means moving between one queue and the next. In our case, it's a fee for queue. Now, the system loading is very important. And you would have seen, I'll show now, in a minute, I'll show one of Barney's famous uh, uh, graphs. And it had system utilization or system loading. We're going to use the term system loading rather than system utilization in our case. We'll denote the system loading, we'll denote it as raw. So, the arrival rate is in units of passengers per second. So that's passengers per second. And that's also passengers per second. That's how fast they're arriving. <coughs> that's how fast we're processing them. And obviously, if that is equal to that, then we have um, uh, a system loading of 100%. If it's less, this is less than that, then it's a slightly loaded system. And it could be heavily loaded. We could overload the system by having more passengers arriving. So let's have a look and see how it applies to elevators. We're going to take a macroscopic view. Um, the most important piece of work, I think, was the one done by Alexandris in, um, in the late 70s. And the most important piece of work, I think, is the, um, the one published in Applied Mathematical Modeling. Um, this is where uh, the whole modeling approach was put in. And from it, average waiting time and average queue length were derived. However, it's very important to, to remember that this assumed steady state conditions. It means that the system carried on running continuously. We don't design like that today, but that's a debate we will have. <coughs> uh, uh, if we go back to the ISO, are you assuming you're going to subject it to 12% continuously, forever? Or are you going to do it for 15 minutes and stop and let it uh, clear the queue? Or are you going to go for, for an hour? So that's an important distinction. And for that, I'm going to introduce the concept of a workspace. So for an elevator, Richard showed an interesting graph last year where he showed passengers arriving. So this is a system, and it's processing passengers. And we've merged the queue and the, the lobby and the lift system in, in, in the same box. They, if, if they come out, the output of the system is handling capacity. The input is arrival rate. That's the, that's the graph Richard showed last year. It was last year, wasn't it? Uh, and he's thinking of the system as an input as an out and an output. And ideally, we'd like the input to match the output, like we do in all control systems. Now, it starts failing here. So at this point, and it's one way of actually checking what the system is doing, where it's falling over, to use Adam's expression. Having a look at this in more detail, now we can put all the relevant parameters. So passengers are boarding here, between the lobby and the elevators. We have L elevators, that's the number of servers. Uh, they alight here, they arrive here. We can actually find lambda. Lambda depends on the expected arrival rate for our office building, 12% and so on, the total building population, and the 300 is to convert from um, percentage of building population in five minutes to passengers per second. It's just a change of units. They're processed based on RTT, so obviously the smaller RTT, the higher the processing rate, obviously that's obvious. And the more passengers it carries, the more elevators it uh, processes them faster. Now, you can see immediately we can get these two variables out. So the difference between steady state and... Uh, to understand this, we talk about system dynamics. Any, any system has dynamics, and the elevator is no different. We can think of an input and an output and see how fast it responds to the input. <coughs> and at steady state, we actually get to a final response where the system settles. That's a classical... Uh, graph which you might have seen. It's a second order under that system. So we excite it with a step function, so suddenly it changes from zero to whatever it is, 12%, and then it responds, overshoots, and then settles. And this is where the steady state concept is important. So if I wait long enough, it will actually get to steady state, and I can understand where it is, or I can decide I'm only going to simulate the system for 15 minutes and see uh, how it responds. Very good video to illustrate this, the concept of system dynamics. This is the Tacoma Narrows um, bridge, which is, uh, <coughs> this is nine, the 7th of November 1940. And it's a, one of the best examples you can see ever for system dynamics. You, could th you think this is actually built of cardboard, but it's not. It's just, it's, a, it's, it's an oversight on uh, uh, system dynamics. And 
it's a good example to show regarding system dynamics because the input is probably wind, other excitation inputs. The output is the displacement. And displacement is increasing continuously. The system is out of control. Um, or it's, it's, uh, it, the deviations are increasing continuously. And it will get to a stage where it, it can't sustain it. Now, I think there's a guy you will see in a minute walking on the bridge. And I think he's the designer trying to prove that, that, that there's nothing wrong with the bridge. <laughs> And it's quite dramatic. When you, uh, you, we usually show that at the beginning of system dynamics courses to students or control systems. So they, they always remember. And you remember the Millennium Bridge, although it's not, it wasn't as drastic as this, but we did have excitation. They had to increase the damping. Arabs, anyone from Arabs here? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Arabs turned, turned a negative thing into a positive thing, and I think give them credit for that. So they came back and they sorted it out uh, completely. So. So that's system dynamics. So in the same way, we can input to the system AR or lambda. And we can have output from the system HC, its handling capacity, or mu. The workspace, the concept of a workspace, we've always, when we run a simulation, if you go to elevate, you can run it for 5 minutes, 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes. That is your workspace. Or you could decide, I want to run this forever, I want to design the system such that it can sustain it, which, which could be a bit more costly, but it could happen, you could do it. You could decide that I want to design for steady state and carry on um, un until it, it's, it settles and the waiting time settles and the queue length settles. It could be costly, but even at long, at long workspaces of 9, 900 seconds, you could still uh, do that. So I'm, I'm going to show you a modular software, it's, a, it's an off-the-shelf software available which is modular. You can drag a block and connect blocks. That's an example. That's what was used to generate some of the stuff in here. It's like Lego. Where you know how, how children play with Lego. You have a block which does this and another block which does this and you just connect the blocks. And for example, this runs for a workspace of 900 seconds. It keeps on generating passengers for 900 seconds, but it needs more time to finish that. So I let it carry on after the 900 seconds to clear all the passengers in the system. Um, there's the queue, the lobby. There's the end servers, the number of elevators, and we have scopes, like the scopes you have electronically, where you can actually see what's happened during that period of time. That's, for example, the number of entities in the queue. And that's just a, a number of blocks. Now, this is going back to system loading, so we have lambda over mu. We need to convert those to uh, lift or elevator parameters. <coughs> so everything will be plotted against the system loading. Now, this is interesting. Alexandris and Allen in this paper also showed that lambda over mu is also p over p max, the car load, the average car load. Now, you can only go as far as filling the car. Once the car is full, you can't exceed p max. But the beauty with system loading, you can overload the system so you can go above lambda over mu. So, if we say that uh, each car carries p, p passengers, then the time to process a passenger is obviously round trip time over number of passengers. So if it's carrying six passengers, it takes it um, 60 seconds. Every passenger has taken 10 seconds to be processed. If I have L cars, then obviously it will take less. It will, it will process it in, in a shorter period of time. So that's mu. We can now take the value of mu and put it in the system. <coughs> and then we have different formula for calculus. So that's the average, Q, uh, average queuing time is Rho over 1 minus Rho. Rho is the system loading. And this is actually the important bit which you will see in a minute. Because Rho, is the, this is constant. That's the round trip time, number of lifts, and P max. This is Rho over 1 minus Rho. So if the system loading is 1, what is this factor? What does this become? That's 1 divided by 1 minus 1, which is 0, which is infinity. And I think that is the, the problem. That is the reason for the problem. If we design it for 100% loading, after some time the system will saturate. We can't design a calculation on 100% and then take that result and move into simulation. It will saturate. We have to adjust the, our formula. We have to adjust the demand. We can, de we can derive as well the average queue length and so on. And that, I've, I've drawn this here. You can see, as rho approaches 100%, this is approaching infinity. So really, the salutary lesson, the practical consequence of this, we can't really design, when we're designing calculation, we're designing for 100%. And that's fine, because constant arrival is constant, it's assumed constant, the RTT is assumed to be a constant, so everything looks fine. As soon as we move into a queuing system, which is what simulation is, that starts going to infinity. 
And in fact, if you try to increase the workspace, simulate for longer than 15 minutes, 20 minutes, the system will completely saturate. And that's when we start tweaking, don't we? And we increase the car capacity. And when we increase the car capacity, basically what we're trying to do is trying to increase it. We, we're not aware of it. I mean, for me, this is the best explanation ever for why we have a problem moving to calculation to simulation. If I'm wrong, tell me. Tell me you've got it all wrong, and there is a good reason all we've known about this. That's fine. But I don't think we've ever been aware uh, of that. That's the case. Now, this is a classical Barney um, curve, and you can see that's going up, and it's going up around 80 90%. There's a lot of similarity between that and this. And that's really where that comes from. So I don't believe that the 80% is a car load. I, I might disagree with some people. I think the 80% was a tool to try to say, stay away from saturation and reduce the loading or increase the handling capacity. And you see it here as well. You see the same. There's the waiting time. The interval carries on increasing linearly. <laughs> but the average waiting time does actually start increasing dramatically. So we've run this, run this under code and under uh, sim events. What you will see here, which is interesting, We've overloaded the system. You can overload the system if you, you just want to check what's happening. For, uh, for a workspace of 900, so that's for 15 seconds, you can overload the system and see what happens. You might want to do that. You might want to see how the system, what happens when it's overloaded. But the more important thing is it is meaningless to talk about average waiting time without talking about the workspace. So I would say if someone turned up tomorrow and said, I've designed the system and my average waiting time is 26 seconds, it is meaningless without stating what the workspace is. Even if they say the workspace is infinite or if they say it's 900 seconds. So I think that's the most important thing. We, we must say what the workspace is and then you can actually talk about average waiting time. Or oh, sorry, that's the average waiting time. So this is saying for this same system and the same arrival rate, if you run it for 300 seconds, that's the average waiting time. Run it for 1200 seconds and that's the average waiting time. I need to come into the end. These are the three practical consequences. The first one, when moving from calculation to simulation, I think the mistake that I've been doing at least, and not understanding what, is we're assuming that 100% is okay in simulation. So most designers would start with calculation, move to simulation, and they find that the system collapses, or it's not very good. Now they might have some spare capacity because they needed 3.3 lifts. You can't put 3.3 lifts, what do you do? You go up to four. So in fact, you have some spare capacity you're not aware of, and that's why sometimes you get away with it. But systematically, you do, we do sometimes do the tweaking, which is, which is a fudge. And the most obvious of these people usually will increase the car capacity and hope that it actually gets better. I think this is the best explanation I've seen, which is random arrivals caused by Poisson process, random processing, and this is caused by the variation in the round trip time because it's a variable. And it's a variable caused by random passenger destinations. And that's what causes the problem under simulation. And as the workspace increases, the system, system saturation and collapses. All we need to do is just amend the quantity of service criteria. This makes it systematic. If you want to teach people how to do things systematically, you've got to give them a systematic approach, <coughs> rather than a black art or a, a rule of thumb. Or so I think all we need to do is see what rule do we want to run under, what is a reasonable rule. You might, we might disagree what it is, whether it's 90%, 92%, 85%, as long as we know what it is. And then we adjust. So basically, we're designing a handling capacity which is slightly larger than the arrival rate to account for this problem. Then we can move systematically from calculation to simulation. I've suggested here 1.5. That's big. That's big. <coughs> so for every four lifts, you're adding another lift. But it always keeps back going to what Adam said yesterday. Reduce it by one lift and see where it saturates. This offers you a tool to know where it saturates before going to simulation. You, would, you can tell me it will saturate at this, at this number. The second consequence, it is meaningless to quote an average waiting time or an average queue length without quoting the workspace. You can say it's infinity, that's fine. You can say it's nine hundred, five minutes, 10 minutes, or 15 minutes. And that's the, that's the uh, uh, evidence. The last one is you can use discrete event simulation to overload systems. Why you would overload them? It might be maybe a building which is under-designed, uh, over-populated, and you want to see what effect it has. But that has to be for a finite workspace. If it's for an infinite workspace, it will saturate. And I've just summarized these three conclusions here. So in order to reconcile calculation and simulation, we amend the quantity of service criteria. And that's a systematic way of doing it. 
It's meaningless to quote the average waiting time without putting the workspace, and you can overload systems and simulate them for overload. So, thank you much for your attention, for being polite, patient, and quiet. <laughs> <laughs>